The world outside is changing all the time. Sometimes in ways we like, sometimes in ways we don't like. And some of the changes we can have some influence over, and some of them we can't. Which means that there are going to be some things that we don't like that we can't influence. Which is why we have to find a safe space inside. And the Buddha offers that safe space in two ways. One in the practice of mindfulness and concentration. And those two practices are connected, they're not separate. That description of mindfulness that we chanted just now, staying focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That describes what you're doing as you're trying to get the mind in a concentration. Stay with the breath. Keep the breath in mind. That's mindfulness. You're alert to the breath. You're alert to the mind. That's alertness. And then there's ardency. When you try to do this well, try to give yourself a really good place to stay here, as continuous as possible. That's what gets the mind in a concentration. That's your safe space in the body. As best you can, you try to fill the body with a sense of ease, sense of well-being, even a sense of fullness and rapture. So you've got your safe place to go. And this is safe not only with regard to events outside, but also events inside the mind. Because as the mind begins to settle down, it sees itself a lot more clearly. And it's going to see some things it likes inside and some things it doesn't like. And at the very least, having a sense of well-being, a sense of comfort. And at least one part of the body, a sense of stability and feeling at home here in the body. That enables you to deal with things coming up in the mind that you'd rather not deal with, but they're going to have to be dealt with. And the dealing with them is in terms of right view and right resolve. They provide the safe space in the mind, thoughts that you can revert to. When you see aspects of yourself that you don't like, things you've done in the past or things that were done to you, and all the reverberations that have developed over the years around those things, you need a way of picking those things apart and putting them in a light that makes it easier to deal with them, easier to put them aside. In terms of right view, this is the view that what you're experiencing is the result of your actions, past actions and present actions. And if the things in your past that you find hard to deal with, the things even in the present you find hard to deal with, remind yourself that you're not alone. This is the larger perspective on karma. The Buddha is not trying to assign blame to people by saying, well, you did bad, and therefore you got to suffer. He's saying, look, we all have bad actions in our past. And these bad actions have been going back and forth, back and forth, so you have no idea who started things. And it gets so that it really doesn't matter. There's a story about a some dead though. When young monk came and see him one evening, he said, "This monk came up and hit me. I hadn't done anything to him at all. He just came up and hit me." And some I said, "No, you hit him first. And he argued over this for a while, and then the young monk went to find another senior monk to complain about some Dao, who wasn't listening to reason. So the senior monk came and asked some Dao, "What's this all about?" And some Dao said, "Well, if you hadn't had any karma with that person in the past, you wouldn't have come up and hit you." But then, of course, that raises the question, well, why did that person hit you that time? Or why did you hit that person? Who hit who first? When you trace it back, that becomes meaningless. And the funny thing is that making it meaningless it takes a lot of sting out of it. 
the part of the mind that says, I've got to right this wrong, that holds on to old wounds. That gets weakened. The part get, that gets shamed by having been engaged in a bad back and forth can take some comfort in the fact that everybody's been engaged in a bad back and forth. This is why we're here in the human realm. It's the realm of good karma and bad karma, all mixed together. The good part of the human realm, though, is that we can make up our mind to develop right resolve. We look at all the trouble that's been caused in the past, and we see certain resolves in the mind can keep the problems going. So we resolve to drop them. We resolve on renunciation. In other words, to drop our fascination with sensuality, planning this sensual pleasure, that sensual pleasure. Realizing that that just weakens the mind, makes it dependent on things outside being just a certain way. And then we struggle and struggle and struggle to get it that certain way, and then they slip out of our hands. And the anger and the resentment and everything that comes from that is going to lead to more unskillful action. It just gets into a spiral, which is the second aspect of right resolve, which is resolve on non-ill will. In other words, you develop at the very least equanimity or better goodwill for all beings. saying that regardless of what your past actions have been or other people's past actions have been, you're going to wish for happiness. You're going to wish for true happiness, true well-being, which means that you're going to try to be skillful in your actions. And to whatever extent you can influence other people to be skillful in theirs, so much the better. But the important thing is you resolve not to repeat that old mistake, whatever the mistake may have been. And then for the suffering you're having now and the suffering that other people are having, or the things that you're doing that are causing suffering now, or that other people are doing, you learn to have, have some compassion for yourself and others. You're realizing that we're going through this world acting on ignorance. We all want happiness. We all want well-being. But we're so confused about what genuine happiness would be and how we can find it. You think about the Buddha after he gained his awakening. Even though he was freed of greed, aversion, and delusion, that didn't mean he looked down on people who had greed, aversion, and delusion. He felt sympathy for them, because he'd come from that place himself. He'd realized how ignorant he had been in the past, in spite of his desires for happiness. He realized that the right view and right resolve are the things that people need to develop. And so that's what he taught. And that, along with all the other factors of the path, the factors that have to do with virtue, those are simply an expression of your right resolve, that you don't want to harm anybody. And they provide the foundation for building that safe space inside. So the different aspects of the path Virtue, concentration, and discernment all help one another along. And they all provide you a safe space, a physical safe space inside where you can have a sense of ease, a mental safe space inside where whatever thoughts come up, that come up in the arena of your understanding of karma, your understanding of where suffering comes from and how it can be cured. And you're resolved to do what you can to put an end to suffering, the causes of suffering, in your attitudes toward yourself and your attitudes toward others. So regardless of the, whatever mess there is in the world outside, or in your personal life, whatever mess there has been in the past, you can find a safe space in the present moment where you can sort things through, both with a sense of well-being, of a mind and concentration, friends with a breath inside, 
So you have a sense of being grounded, a sense of belonging here. And in the safe space of right view and right resolve, the right view that helps you see the past and the present in the light of karma, in the light of cause and effect. And in that larger light of the Buddha's knowledge is that gave rise to his understanding about karma and cause and effect, realizing that we've been through many, many lifetimes, so many that it's impossible to count them. And our karma has been taking up and us up and down. We've been people that, if we went back to meet them in the past, we wouldn't recognize ourselves at all. People, animals, all kinds of things. We've been all kinds of things. Done all kinds of things. As the Buddha said, the mind is capable of more things than you can imagine. And it's very, very changeable. Which means that some people are reaping the results of good karma now, but their attitudes are no longer any good. They've changed. And other people are re reaping the results of bad karma in the past, but they're not. doesn't mean they're bad people now. Their attitudes have changed. Simply that the impersonal nature of cause and effect has led to these paradoxical outcomes. So if you have a sense of paradox, you have a sense of infinity, just how huge this project has been, all our inner related actions. As the Buddha said, it would be hard to find somebody who hasn't been your mother in a previous lifetime at some point, someone who hasn't been your father, someone who hasn't been your brother or sister, son or daughter. The relationships get all mixed up like that. So you develop a sense of sangwega, which can be translated as dismay, can also be translated as terror, the sense of how big this process has been, how long it's been going on. If you ever drive up Interstate 5 and look out across the ocean as you go past Camp Pendleton, remind yourself that the water you see is nothing compared to the tears you've shed over these many, many lifetimes. And the right response to that is to want to gain release, realizing that if you're not careful, you can create a lot more bad karma in the, in the future. You get your intentions right now, but as the Buddha said, it's very rare that a person who is reaping the results of past good karma without realizing where they come from, it's very rare that that person will not get heedless, not get careless. And then start doing things that lead to a downward spiral. So when you think about how complicated it is and how huge this process is, the appropriate reaction is not to get down on yourself or not to get down on others. It's simply to want release. To be happy for other people when they can find release because that confirms the fact that it is possible. And to be happy about any thoughts inside you that want again release as well. Because ultimately that's the only really safe space. that you can find in the mind, but it is absolutely safe, because there's no more karma there, which means there can be no more bad karma, no more harm. Up until that point, things are a little precarious, but at the very least, with the first taste of awakening, you're sure that you're going to get your way out. So that's what we aim for. To create the 
relative safe space through a practice of concentration or development of right view and right resolve. So we can find the absolute safe space when the mind is released. <laughs>